Hello, Dan. Are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? How are you? Yes. I'm good. good. How are you? Good. Maybe you, you may want to uh, go up a little bit on the volume. On the mic? Oh, perfect. Yes. I can Sorry, hear I, you. I, can I just hear. had it on the desk. Yeah, perfect. Okay, I can hear you very well. Good. This is a good test. Perfect. So, uh, you know how to uh, share? You know, when you go to the, the Zoom application there, Mm -hmm. There is a button that you have there in the in the bottom that says uh, share. Yep. Okay. So right now I'm sharing the uh, the screen. Can mm -hmm. you see the screen that I'm sharing right now? The... Yeah, the PCCM conference. Yeah. Perfect. So um, so that's what I'm sharing right now. So it means that um, if uh, uh, once I stop sharing, then you will be able to share. Like right now, you cannot override what I'm sharing. Okay. Uh, because I'm the uh, I'm the uh, the person who has control here, then uh, I can get you know uh, once I stop sharing, that you can take over. Okay. So you can share your screen and do the talk and everything. So, okay. Okay. So in the meantime, you can put your mic on, on mute so there's no uh, interference or any of that. Anything, any if, if something happens or anything, I'll just text you. I'll just send you a text. So if you wanna send me a message uh, through the text, everything you know, something that you're not you know, comfortable with or you cannot share or something, just let me know. Sounds good. I can do that. Okay. Okay, then. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks.
Oh, can you yes. see my screen? I can see your screen. Okay. Okay. All right. So I'll, I'll be talking about staging for non-small cell lung cancer this afternoon. So an outline for the talk, um, we'll discuss the importance of, of non-small cell lung cancer staging and treatment, uh, review the components that make up staging in detail. Uh, we'll talk about the utility and limitations of radiographic staging, as well as the role for bronchoscopy and EBUS. And then lastly, we'll talk about some evidence-based technical aspects to staging EBUS itself. So why is lung cancer staging important? Um, as we all know, lung cancer uh, affects a lot of people in the U.S. and you know, worldwide even uh, every year. Uh, in terms of estimated new cases in 2019, lung cancer uh, for men and women was a number two uh, was a number two cause. And then when you look at cancer-related deaths every year, uh, lung cancer is by far the number one cause of uh, cancer-related deaths in the U.S. And when you look at the time of diagnosis for lung cancer, um, the pie chart on the left here, you see that more than half of the lung cancers that are diagnosed at their time of diagnosis, uh, the cancer is already metastasized. About three-fourths of them uh, have spread to a, at least to a regional lymph node with only about 15% of cancers at the time of diagnosis um, being localized. And that probably contributes to this poor five-year um, percent survival, five-year of only of less than 20%. When you take this five-year survival and you uh, look at it further and, and um, by, by stage, uh, when lung cancers are diagnosed, uh, early stage localized, their five-year survival is much better at 57% uh, compared to only 5.2% when they're metastatic. Um, this 5.2% has definitely gotten better in more recent years in the setting of immunotherapy and more chemotherapeutic agents that can target um, mutations. However, uh, the, the bigger number to take away from here is, is the, the number of patients that do well uh, with a much better improved five-year survival for localized cancers. This is a, a flow chart looking at uh, a very simplified version of the NCCN guidelines. And um, for non-small cell lung cancer staging, and, and the big part about this flow graph uh, is, is looking at which can patients would be candidates for treat, curative intent treatment. And by curative intent, I mean surgical resection or definitive radiation therapy. So when you look at patients who have stage one or two lung cancer who are operable candidates, um, who are surgical, uh, you're able to surgically resect. Sorry, who you're able to surgically resect um, patients who get an anatomic lobectomy have a five-year overall survival of 78% and a disease-free survival of 73%. Um, and then when you look at patients who are still at early stage but medically inoperable and they get definitive radiation therapy, and this is by stereotactic ablative radiation therapy, their five-year survival is a little bit worse. Um, the data here is a little bit more um, all over the place, but the, the, what's published is anywhere ranging from 29 to 69% but still um, better than if you were stage three or stage four in getting uh, chemo radiation. There are a small subset of patients who are stage three, as you can see here, three A, specifically those who don't have nodal involvement, who may be surgical resection candidates. But again, um, this is a bit more controversial. And uh, again, the big thing is determining whether they uh, would be um, candidates for treatment by curative intent. The ACCP uh, does have um, clinical practice guidelines on the diagnosis and management of lung cancer. The, the most recent edition is the third edition, and this was published back in 2013, uh, so it's been a while. Um, but these guidelines are, are very comprehensive. Um, they talk all about lung, from lung nodule management to staging to lung cancer treatment, um, and they provide the outline to a lot of this talk. They are at the same time also outdated. Um, so if you do read these guidelines, know that there's a lot of stuff in here that has changed since 2013. When we're talking about 
staging, uh, the two main things to uh, two main terms that are used are clinical versus pathologic. And these letters come before the TMN um, staging, which we'll talk about. But clinical basically is any information you can gather in terms of staging without surgery. So labs, patient's history and physical exam, any imaging modalities, including CT, PET, bone scan, or MRI. And then clinical does also include invasive staging by EBIS or mediastinoscopy. Pathologic staging, as I mentioned, is determined after surgical resection if the patients get them. Other terms that you, uh, prefixes that you may see in staging that are not as commonly used. So Y is for restaging, R is for recurrence, and that's the stage at the time of recurrence or if they re, and then A is uh, autopsy. So when we, when we talk about TMN staging, uh, when we talk about staging, uh, the TNM criteria is um, basically the universal language used in staging. And again, this is TNM for tumor descriptors, nodal assessment, and metastases, not TMN, TNM. And um, basically, this uh, the, the whole purpose of the TNM staging is to consistently describe the anatomic uh, extent of the lung cancer disease, and that ultimately translates to treatment options and patient outcomes. Um, these guidelines are published by um, large international lung cancer organizations, um, including the American Joint Committee on Cancer, the uh, Union International Contra Lung Cancer, and the International Association on the Study of Lung Cancer. Uh, staging dates all the way back to the 1940s when it was um, first described and again, the eighth edition is the, the most recent edition. The ACCP um, clinical practice guidelines from 2013, th those actually only have, those have the seventh edition in them. So that, that component of those guidelines is outdated. So what makes up the TNM eighth edition? Um, so they basically reviewed over 77,000 cases. The majority of them are retrospective, as you can see here. And when you look at the regional distribution, the majority of the cases came out of Europe and Asia with a surprisingly small percentage coming out of North America. And when you look at the treatment for these patients, 80% um, of them, 80 plus percent of them got surgery of some form or another uh, with 57% of them only getting surgery. So there's a lot of surgical patients. And then the TNM criteria, basically what they translate to are different stages. So I'm sure you guys have all seen this table before, um, but the, the T criteria are all associated with the stage, the M and the N criteria are also associated with the stage. And the way you, you utilize this table is the highest T, N, or M criteria would then give you the patients, uh, translate to the patient's stage, which then would translate to their treatment. So we'll first talk about uh, the T descriptors, the first one being tumor size. Uh, so what they did in the eighth edition is they they split the size up by centimeters, ranging anywhere from less than one centimeter to more than seven centimeters. Uh, one to three centimeters being T1, three to five being T2, five to seven being T3, and greater than seven centimeters being T4. And how they came up with these numbers is they basically looked at all 77,000 uh, of those cases, looked at uh, just the tumor sizes themselves, and, and looked at what their overall five-year uh, mortality would be, and they and they grouped them uh, based on that mortality. And as you can see here, patients who were T4 with larger tumors uh, obviously did worse. How do you measure the um, tumor size? So the ACCP says that you should do it on lung windows, in the axial cuts, and then you measure the greatest diameter. Um, they also say it should be during inspiration. Most CT scans are done in inspiration. The eighth edition was the first edition uh, to look uh, at subsolid nodules. Um, and what they, they recommend is when you have a subsolid nodule, so as you can see here, one with both the solid component as well as a ground glass component, um, you should measure and stage based off only the solid component um, since uh, that uh, had more prognostic indicators on it compared to the whole nodule size when it was subsolid. Uh, 
how do you stage ground glass nodules? Um, so in the past, uh, these were previously defined as probably your bronchial alveolar carcinomas, but in the eighth edition, uh, they, they described it more based off the histopathologic uh, correlate to the ground glass nodules. So for nodules that were less than five millimeters that are pure ground glass, they are not staged. And these are most commonly your atypical adenomatous hyperplasias. For pure crown grass nodules that measure from 0.6 to 3 centimeters, these are considered uh, clinical uh, TIS, so adenocarcinoma in situ. And then nodules that are, again, pure ground glass, but greater than 3 centimeters, these are T1A. Uh, and they most often correlate with a lipidic predominant type of adenocarcinoma. So aside from tumor sizing, uh, the other characteristics um, uh, that are described under the tumor descriptors are airway involvement. Uh, so if you have involvement of your main bronchi, but not your main carina, it's considered T2. In the past, they had described the distance of the main carina making a difference, but in the eighth criteria, it doesn't make a difference. As long as it's a main bronchi without main carina involvement, it's considered T2. If the main carina is involved or if the trachea is involved, it's considered T4. When you're uh, for the in terms of lung parenchyma, if uh, if there is any degree of atelectasis or post obstruction, then it's considered a T2. If you have a satellite nodule that's in the same lobe as your um, as the uh, as the nodule of concern, then that was considered T3. And if you have a satellite nodule in a different lobe but of the same ipsilateral lung then it's considered T4. How about a nerve involvement? So if you have phrenic nerve involvement, uh, which can be seen in patients who have uh, unilateral elevated hemidiaphragm, that's considered T3. And then if you have recurrent laryngeal nerve involvement, that's considered T4. Um, so as, you, as we all know, the, or recall from anatomy, the recurrent laryngeal nerve on the left side uh, often comes under the arch of the aorta. And when you have cancers that invade the mediastinum, as you can see here, this is under the aortic arch, and you can see over here under the aortic arch, they can affect the recurrent laryngeal, and these patients can present with hoarseness and uh, vocal cord dysfunction, paralysis. Um, for the mediastinum, if the pericardium is involved, this is T3. Sometimes on CT scan, it's hard to appreciate pericardial involvement. Sometimes on PET scan, it's a little bit more obvious, but again, this is something that's probably more de um, described surgically. And then if there's any degree of uh, mediastinal invasion, it's considered T4. Um, so if the heart's involved, the great vessels are involved, as you can see here uh, with your pulmonary artery. If the diaphragm is involved, it's considered T4. And if the esophagus is involved, it's T4. And um, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a lot of information to remember in terms of the tumor descriptors. One way that I uh, categorize these in my head is uh, when a patient is considered at least stage three, the more than likely not a candidate for curative intent. Um, so if you look at the, the tumor descriptor uh, staging, anything that is T4 is automatically a three, regardless of nodal or metastatic evaluation. So if you're only looking at um, things within the tumor descriptors that we just went through that make you a T4 candidate, your, the, the lowest staging that a patient would be would be at least 3A. Next, we'll talk about lymph node assessment. Um, there's too much uh, in lung cancer staging to talk about, so I, uh, so I don't go over the exact locations of all the lymph nodes and their anatomic borders, but uh, Radiology Assistant is a good website um, to go through for these, but in general, uh, your single digit lymph node numbers are in your mediastinum and they go from one through nine as you move from um, cephalad to caudad. And then your double digits are, are gonna be your hilum and your intraparenchymal lymph nodes. So when talking about lymph node uh, assessment in lung cancer, it's also important to remember the lymph node drainage patterns, like anatomic lymph node drainage patterns. Um, so for the, each, each lung and lobe is going to uh, drain to a certain lymph, or is most likely 
to drain to a certain lymph node first, and that's something to think about when you are staging a patient with lung cancer. So for instance, a patient with, um, so the right upper lobe itself, it's gonna certainly drain to its hilar lymph node first, but then from there, it's likely to go to your superior mediastinum node or your station four, whereas your right middle and your right lower lobe, again, they'll go to their hilar node first, but then the next place they're likely to drain to is the subcarinal space, followed by your parasophageals. To the left upper lobe, uh, again, they'll drain to their hilar node first, but after that, it'll actually well, most likely go to the AP window, and, but that's for your apical, post, uh, apical um, uh, posterior and your anterior lobes, whereas the, the lingula is more likely to go to the subcarinal node first. Uh, and your left lower lobe, again, goes to hilar, and then it'll go to your subcarinal. So it's important to think about these normal drainage patterns when you're staging a patient. So the nodal assessment for the TNM, um, it ranges anywhere from N0 to N3 disease. Um, and the definitions for radiographic clinical staging when you're looking at a lymph node. So by CT scan, it's, it's defined as a short axis diameter of anything greater than one centimeter. So as you can see here on this Tyler node, um, you measure by the short axis, not the long axis. So short axis, if it's greater than one centimeter, then it's considered a, a positive node by CT criteria. Contrast images when you're looking at CTs can be helpful, especially in the, uh, when you're evaluating the hilar regions so that you don't confuse a, a branch of your pulmonary artery for a lymph node. And then for PET scans, um, anything with the SUV max of greater than 2.5 when you're looking at lymph nodes is, would be considered a positive lymph node by PET scan. So what are the different uh, um, breakdowns for your nodal assessment? So N0 disease means that you have no regional lymph node metastases defi uh, defined by CT, PET, or eventually bronchoscopic uh, criteria. So N1, so if you have a mass, uh, if your your lung cancer is in your lower lobe on the right side, um, your N1 is gonna be your ipsilateral hilar or your ipsilateral parabronchial or intrapulmonary nodes. N2 is going to be your ipsilateral mediastinal nodes or your subcrino parasophageal nodes. And then N3 is going to be your contralateral mediastinal nodes, your con any contralateral hilar or intraparenchymal nodes, and then uh, either any scalene or supraclavicle node, whether it's a right side or left side, is considered N3. So similar to T-staging, the way I think about N-staging, um, again, what's, what's going to get you to at least N3? So any N2 positive, uh, regardless of your T criteria, will at least be staged as a, a stage 3A for non-small cell lung cancer. So uh, a few more things about nodal assessment. So comparing the 8th edition to the 7th edition, there really were no changes in terms of your N0 to N3 definitions. Uh, and that's because when they looked at each individual nodal station alone within an N category, they didn't see any difference in survival for those nodes, and that's why they didn't make any changes. But one thing that they did note on the eighth edition was uh, the number of nodal zones involved. And, and we'll talk about nodal zones in a minute here, but the more nodal zones involved within an N category did have a prognostic impact in the setting that more nodal zones involved within an N category had a worse prognosis. So what do I mean by nodal zones? So the third addition to the ACCP guidelines, they, they split the nodal zones up into these five zo zones. Um, so supraclavicular, um, include your cervical and supraclavicular lymph nodes. The superior mediastinal um, nodes included your um, two to three to four. Your aortic nodes or your AP zone was your subaortic and your paraortic lymph nodes. Your inferior mediastinal zone um, so that's your subcrinal and your uh, parasophageals, and then your N1 nodes, so your hilar as well as your, your lobar segmental and subsegmental zones. So what I, what I mean by this and what they saw was that in a patient who had N1 disease, uh, a single zone N1 disease had better survival than a patient who had multi-zone N, uh, N1 disease. So if there was just involvement in their hilar node, they had better survival than if someone who had involvement of their hilar and a intraparenchymal 
a lymph node all within the N1 category. Uh, another example of this would be that in a patient who had multi-zone N1 disease, so they had uh, involvement of multiple zones in the, so the hilar and the intraparenchymal, they had similar survival curves as a patient who had N2 disease, but it was only involved in one zone. Um, but the reason that they didn't include this in the eighth criteria is because the subsets for this were all too small for validation. But um, moving forward in future TMN, uh, sorry, TNM criteria, uh, nodal subdivisions will likely be included um, as they may provide better prognostic stratification and then ultimately lead to different uh, treatment options for these patients. Um, another thing I want to mention is nodal skip metastases. So these are basically when you have N2 involvement but not N1. So if you saw it had a positive node here but not uh, in N1 which is closer to the lesion. Why it happens isn't really clear, um, and, it, and it can be seen in up to 25% of cases. Uh, but what they do note um, is that there is no survival difference in patients who have skip metastases. And then lastly, the M, um, the, uh, M staging. So M is, stands for metastases, obviously, and it's divided into M1A, M1B, and M1C. Uh, M1A uh, is basically intrathoracic metastases, so a tumor in the contralateral lung or in the pleura, as you can see here and here, or in the pericardium, or if you have a malignant pleura fusion. So those all would be M1A. Whereas M1B and M1C are extrathoracic metastases. Uh, so this includes this, uh, M1B, which is a single extrathoracic metastases, and that includes uh, a single non-regional lymph node, so lymph node outside the chest, and again, not including your cervical or scalenes. And then M1C, uh, which are multiple, multiple extrathoracic uh, metastases. When they looked at survival between the M1B, A, B, and C, which is probably why they, um, they split it up this way, but M1A survival was similar to M1B. And uh, I did want to note that M1B did also include uh, the chest wall, as well as the contralateral diaphragm. And then when they looked at M1B and M1C, um, patients who had multiple METs versus a solitary MET did worse. And then patients who uh, had just a solitary MET, it didn't make a difference where it was, except if it, that solitary MET was in the brain, you know, in which case their survival was lower. So how do you work up patients who have suspected um, metastatic disease? Uh, uh, ACCP recommends that you obtain a tissue diagnosis to confirm. If this is a patient who doesn't have a lung cancer diagnosis yet, but has a PET scan with areas outside the chest cavity that are accessible for biopsy, then I recommend to biopsy those areas first, because then if they're positive, then you can get the stage for the patient, as well as a tissue diagnosis all in one procedure, as opposed to um, have the patient undergo two procedures. Um, I do have a point here about uh, bone biopsies. Um, there are concerns out there that there is less cellular in the bone biopsies, so the tissue may not be as helpful and not sufficient for molecular markers. So that's one thing to consider when you're choosing a site to biopsy. And then also uh, when you talk about lung cancer, uh, adrenal, are a common site for metastases, however, can also be a common site for false positives. So adrenal adenomas can be seen in 69% of the general population. Um, other false positives, uh, when you're looking at metastatic disease, can also be degenerative bone disease or bone fractures in the older patient populations. So what do we do for patients who have uh, multiple pulmonary nodules um, concerning for synchronous primary lung cancers? Uh, so this doesn't happen very often with an incidence of only 2% of uh, patients per year, but it's defined as um, two lung nodules that have the same, his uh, any that can meet any of these three criteria. So the first one being they have the same histology, they're in different lobes with no nodal um, metastases. Uh, or if they have different histology or molecular genetic characteristics, or the third criteria that they could meet is if they have the same, same histology but are separated by greater than four years between the diagnoses. And a lot of the times it's hard to dis, um, 
differentiate between whether uh, these are satellite nodules that may be T3 or T4 disease, or if they're two separate nodules, and these are uh, nodules that are often, or images that are often discussed at a tumor board um, to get more of a consensus opinion from uh, multiple specialists. Um, how do these patients get um, staged in terms of the T and M criteria? So uh, you basically, what they recommend is that you apply the highest T descriptor followed by the total number of nodules. So in this example, you have three nodules, uh, two of them pure ground glass, one subsolid. Uh, so the two pure ground glass are less than three centimeters. Um, and the one subsolid nodule then would give you the highest T criteria. So in that case, you would call it T1A and have a parentheses of three. What are some limitations to the eighth edition? Uh, so one being lymphangitic carcinomatosis. Uh, so they don't um, really give any guidelines on how to stage these patients. And part of it is because the subset of patients was so small. So there was only 69 cases of this um, out of the 77,000 that they reviewed. Um, so in patients who have lymphangitic carcinomatosis, they don't give any guidelines on how that contributes to their staging. Plural, plural uh, invasion can be tricky. Uh, and this is specifically, for instance, so T2 is considered visceral pleural invasion. But when you're looking at a CT scan, it's really hard, if not possible, to tell if there's any degree of invasion there. A lot of this is uh, done surgically uh, or when they look at the path samples themselves and there's question of whether there'd be a role for MRI in helping um, clinically and radiographically stage these patients with clear invasion better. They don't have any inclusion for targetable mutations and this is something that um, well, maybe you'll see in future versions but we know that uh, outcomes can uh, for patients can change uh, quite drastically depending on whether they have a target of a mutation or not and that obviously plays a role in in their treatment um, options. Uh, another limitation is the geographic variation of the data collected so as you saw um, 80 plus percent of the patients of the 77,000 patients reviewed all came from Asia or Europe uh, and different continents have different uh, prevalence of cancer and types of lung cancer. And then lastly, uh, inter-observer variability with nodule measurements. And that's specifically when uh, we are talking about subsolid nodules and, and how they're measured. So next I'll talk about modalities to clinical uh, non-small cell lung cancer staging. So first, CT scans. Um, this is often the initial clinical staging modality that you get. Um, this is often where the lung cancers themselves are first seen and diagnosed. Um, and CT scans are readily available. So how accurate are they? Uh, so what they did in the, the um, ACC clinical practice guidelines is they uh, basically did a big systematic review looking at the accuracy of CT scanning or non-invasive clinical staging in the mediastinum. They looked at um, a multitude of studies with a total of over 7,000 patients. Um, among those patients, the prevalence of mediastinal metastases by CT was 30%, with a median sensitivity of only 55% and a specificity of only uh, of 81%. So with that sensitivity, one of the limitations of CT is obviously you can overstage patients, and at the same time, you can understage patients. So what they saw when they looked at uh, these patients was that 5 to 15% of them with uh, clinical T1 N0 disease, so no lymph node metastases by C2 criteria are found to have positive lymph nodes when they're um, surgically sampled. So is PET scan any better? Uh, what are some ad additional benefits or benefits in general to look at using the utilization of PET scanning uh, when you're staging a non-small cell lung cancer? First off, it can help you further risk stratify nodules. So if you have a nodule on a, on a CT scan and you're not clear if this is cancer or not, if it's FDG avid, that can obviously help you further risk stratify whether this needs to be biopsied. It of course gives you the chance to clinically stage a mediastinum as well. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, an SUV max of over 2.5 is considered positive for a lymph node. 
Um, it can give you an indication of the tumor's metabolic activity. So uh, some types of cancer, uh, lung cancer, are more metabolic than others. And then, of course, it gives you an ability to evaluate for extrathoracic disease, which a CT of the chest at least uh, can't. So who needs a PET? Um, the ACCP says that any patient who you are essentially considering curative intent treatment for should get a PET scan. Uh, but there are a few exceptions to this. So if it's uh, pure ground glass opacities, you shouldn't get a PET scan because uh, it, it may not light up. If it's a peripheral clinical stage 1A tumor, uh, you don't need a PET scan. And then if PET scan is not available, they say a abdominal CT and bone scan is an acceptable alternative. And then they also do make the point that I mentioned earlier that if you have a PET scan that is suggestive of METs elsewhere, um, that, that should be sampled to confirm that prior to starting treatment. So how accurate is, it, how accurate is, is staging by PET? Um, again, they did a systematic review uh, combining multiple studies looking at the accuracy of PET scanning in staging, uh, had over 4,000 patients. The, mean, the median prevalence of mediastinal METs by PET was 28% with a sensitivity of 80% and a specificity of 88%. So if you compare that to CT scan, uh, PET is more accurate than CT for non-invasive staging. But it also has limitations. So um, there was a rate, higher rate of incorrect upstaging when they compared PET to conventional staging. And they, they, define, they define conventional staging as anything within clinical staging outside of the PET scan. So uh, exam, CT, and even included bronchoscopy and mediastinoscopy for biopsies. So with a higher rate of incorrect upstaging, you um, could potentially direct the patient away from curative resection if you stage by PET scan alone. And then at the same time, um, about 4% of the patients with stage one disease um, that were PET negative were then found to have um, positive mediastinal disease. So it can also over and under stage similar to CT scan, um, but the rates are lower. What are additional limitations to PET? Um, so there obviously are things that are PET positive, they're not cancer that can light up on a PET scan. So granulomatous or other inflammatory disease in the, in the lungs as well as infections. There is a size limitation to PET scan. So smaller nodules um, may not be detected on a PET scan that could still be cancerous. And then the histologic variation and uptake um, so some slower growing cancers, less aggressive cancers like uh, in situ or even carcinoids um, may not have uh, sufficient uptake on a PET scan um, to be concerning for malignancy, which then would be a false negative. Um, and then what, who, which patients need brain MRI? Uh, I just put this in here. Um, uh, in, According to the ACCP guidelines, any patients with clinical stage three or four should have a brain MRI, um, but it is a grade 2C recommendation. Next for uh, clinical staging, we'll talk about endobronchial ultrasound and its role. So um, for those who aren't familiar, um, EBIS is a modality to sample the intrathoracic lymph nodes via bronchoscopy. This is a tip of an EBIS scope. Uh, and the, the lymph nodes that are accessible by EBIS include 2, 3, 4, 7, uh, 10, and 11. Um, I'll talk more about EBIS staging in itself later, but uh, first I want to mention when is it indicated and talk about how accurate it is. So, so uh, in order to discuss when it's indicated, the, the ACCP guidelines, they, they split uh, the intrathoracic lymphadenopathy into four different groups. To, to better um, to make it clear about when it's indicated. So group A involves patients who have mediastinal infiltration. So as you can see here, um, the mediastinum is completely infiltrated with uh, cancer. It may or may not encircle vessels. And, and there's not clear lymph node anatomy here due to the infiltration. Group B is probably what we see the most, which is when you just have enlarged mediastinal lymph nodes that are discrete and can be seen and measured. 
Group C is when you don't, you have normal mediastinal lymph nodes by criteria, but you have a central tumor and you have suspected N1 disease. Uh, and in, uh, in these patients, the chance of having N2 or, or N3 disease, despite what your CT or PET shows, is relatively high, so 20 to 25%. And then the last group, group D, is when you have normal mediastinal lymph nodes, you have a peripheral tumor that's clinical stage one, uh, and in which case these patients, the chance of mediastinal involvement is lower. So these four groups ultimately translate to their, their recommendations on who needs a complete staging of the mediastinum. So uh, they say that patients who fit group B criteria, so those who have discrete mediastinal lymph node enlargement by CT or by PET scan um, need complete mediastinal staging. And again, this is due to the uh, high false positive and, and negative false negative uh, rates of PET or CT alone that can lead to either over or under staging. Uh, the other group of patients that need complete staging are those who have um, suspected N1 or central tumor, so that was group C. So these patients may have normal mediastinums by CT or PET scan, but have either a central tumor uh, or have suspected N1 disease. And again, the reason that these patients should have complete staging is due to the um, high chance that they may they have N2 or N3 disease that you're just not seeing on, uh, on the CT or the PET scan. So who does not need staging? Um, so patients uh, who fit group D criteria, so those were the peripheral clinical stage one, a, uh, cancers who don't have any mediastinal or high adenopathy by CT criteria. And these, they, the recommendation is that these patients do not need staging. However, one thing to note is that the false negative rate in these patients with no enlargement on the nose is approximately 10%. So about 10% of the patients who don't stage in this group may ultimately have positive nodes uh, during surgical resection. Um, and the, a negative PET scan carries a false negative rate about 4%, so a little bit best, better than CT, but know that, that there is still a, a, a false negative rate. And then the other group that doesn't need me, uh, staging uh, was group A. Um, so patients who have uh, um, invasion of their mediastinum by tumor. And this is because these patients would already be 3A um, since their N2 nodes are uh, involved and a mediastinal staging in, in that scenario would not change their treatment recommendations. So how accurate is EBIS? Um, there are two, the two larger systematic reviews looking at EBIS. Um, the first one being published in 2009, looking at 11 studies. And the second, also being in 2009, looking at 10 different studies, both showing a fairly high sensitivity uh, and both showing a specificity of 100% for EBIS, so, so accurate. What's the alternative to EBIS? So this is where we'll discuss about mediastinoscopy. So mediastinoscopy, for those who don't know, is um, done uh, by surgeons, and it involves an incision above the suprasternal notch, and then they insert a scope along the trachea. Uh, and sample lymph nodes. Uh, prior to EBIS, this was a gold standard for mediastinal staging. So how does it compare to, to EBIS? Um, so EBIS can be done under moderate sedation as it's done here, whereas mediastinoscopy requires the operating room with general anesthesia. In terms of morbidity, um, EBIS is a very safe procedure with a very low morbidity and complication rate. Um, Although mediastinoscopies is also low, it is higher than EBIS. When you look at the nodes that are accessible, um, more nodes are accessible by EBIS than by mediastinoscopy, particularly your hyalur nodes. And then when you look at cost of the procedure alone, mediastinoscopy is more expensive. And then mediastinoscopy also does run the additional risk of um, adhesion formation and fibrosis after the procedure that may make it more challenging uh, if either another uh, mediastinoscopy is needed or if the patient ultimately undergoes surgical resection. Um, how does mediastinoscopy uh, fare up when they looked at it uh, in retrospective reviews? So um, again, this was part of from the ACCP clinical practice guidelines where they looked at a bunch of studies uh, totaling 9,000 patients who had mediastinoscopy. 
with a median sensitivity of 78% and a negative predictive value of 91%, which are not bad. Um, but uh, they did note that about 50% of the false negatives were due to nodes that were not accessible by media stenoscopy. When they compared EBIS versus media stenoscopy, this was a, a study, a, a prospective controlled study where all patients um, underwent both EBIS and mediastinoscopy, and they essentially saw no difference in pathologic staging between the two procedures. Um, and that's, uh, with that in mind, the, the, ACs, the, the recommendations are that if a patient needs to undergo mediastinal staging, that EBIS, EBIS TBNA be done over surgical staging as a best first case. Um, if your EBIS is negative and there's still a high clinical suspicion, then you can consider surgical staging, um, but sometimes a second EBIS is actually done before that. Uh, and then the last few slides, we'll talk about uh, performing a, a staging EBIS in itself. Uh, so EBIS has been, uh, was first described in 2004. Um, again, this is an EBIS scope, has an outer diameter of uh, the tip of an EBIS scope has an outer diameter of 6.9 millimeters with a working channel of 2.2 millimeters. Uh, as you can see here in the picture, the camera is not at the tip of the scope like a, a normal bronchoscope. This is the ultrasound probe. And, and the, the um, direction of view for the camera is at 35 degrees. So but for those of you who've used an ebiscope before, um, it's kind of like walking uh, while holding a stick in front of you and looking up. So driving it can be more challenging. The needles that we use have dimples on them and that allows us to, to see the needle itself when we're sampling the lymph nodes. When performing an EBIS and mediastinal staging, uh, we look at um, all lymph nodes and lymph nodes that are larger than five millimeters are, sa are sampled. And when you're sampling, you start at the highest end node stage first. So you start at your uh, N2 or N3 nodes that are N3 rather nodes that are larger than five millimeters and you sample to uh, N1. The way we sample uh, is recommended to go from subcapsular space to subcapsular space. And the reason for that is um, uh, in your lymph node, this is your subcapsular space here. Uh, you have macrophages that are basically a front line of defense for your lymph node. And when you have invasion of your lymph nodes, for instance, by cancer tumor cells, uh, they first come through the afferent lymphatic vessel, and then they will destroy this, um, your macrophages here before they invade the cell. So by spanning the entire lymph node when you're biopsying them, especially including the subcapillary space, you, you increase your, your likelihood of getting tumor cells. Um, when it comes to performing AEBIS itself, uh, there, um, is there any benefit in doing moderate sedation over general anesthesia? Basically, um, no, there's, there's really no data that shows diagnostic yield being different between the two. Uh, one thing to keep in mind um, is that if you do use an endotracheal tube of general anesthesia, it can block access to some of your superior mediastinal nodes. But ultimately, they say that there is insufficient evidence to recommend uh, one, one modality, modality to the other when you're talking about sedation. What about the use of rapid on-site cytology? And this is when you have a cytologist in the room who will look at your, uh, your needle aspiration samples and let you know if you have lymphocytes or not. Um, this was the only randomized control study looking at it. Um, this was out of Japan, published in 2013. Um, and they randomized patients to either have rows or no rows. And what they found was that patients who had rapid on-site cytology did have less passes, but the bronchoscopy time was the same and the yield was the same. Um, so the recommendations that there really is no difference and that you can perform bronchoscopy with or without rows. Uh, and the one thing to mention about using rapid eye cytology is your, um, the benefit of rows is gonna vary dependent, very quite drastically depending on your institution and the quality of either the pathologist or the um, pathology technician that's down there looking at your samples. Um, when talking about technical aspects to EBIS, uh, is there any different be difference between suction, the use of suction or no suction with your passes? And then is there any difference in the number of passes? So looking at suction versus no suction, this was published in 2012 as a prospective randomized trial where uh, they used a suction on samples one and three, 
and no section on samples two and four. Um, that was the only randomized one that I really found and basically there was no difference in diagnostic yield. So you don't have to use suction. In terms of number of passes, um, this was a study done out of Korea published in 2008 where they looked at 100 patients um, who underwent EBIS uh, and they found that the sample adequacy when you got to three passes uh, reached 100 percent. So, so basically it means you only need three passes. Um, uh, however, if you're looking for molecular markers, the recommendation is that you do four passes. What about needle size? Does it make a difference if it's a 21 versus a 22 gauge? Uh, there's a lot of smaller, there's a lot of smaller studies looking at this. Um, one of which that described better histological structure with 21 gauge needles, but more bleeding. The largest study looking at needle size was a review of the acquired database where they looked at over 1200 patients and basically saw no difference in sample adequacy or diagnosis made based on needle size. And then does using a stylet or no stylet make a difference? This is a randomized controlled trial published in CHEST a few years ago, and, and basically they found no difference um, in using a stylet or not. Um, and then lastly, I want to talk about suspicious lymph node features on an ultrasound. So this was a, um, a retrospective review looking at over a thousand lymph node images for patients, and they basically um, split the lymph node or uh, evaluate these six features of each lymph node uh, and defined it as um, for size. So was it smaller or less than one centimeter? Was the shape either oval or round? Were the margins distinct or not distinct? Was there a homogeneous or a heterogeneous echogenicity to it? Was there a central hyalur structure? And then was there a central necrosis sign or not? And when they did multivariate analysis on this, they found four different independent predictors, the predictive factors for uh, lymph node metastases by ultrasound imaging alone. Uh, and these are the four. So if there's a round shape to the lymph node, if there is a distinct margin, if it does appear heterogeneous, and if there is a coagulation necrosis sign, um, these were associated with uh, a metastatic node. Um, and when all four categories were used together 96, or when all four categories were not present, then 96 of the nodes were proven to be uh, benign. Um, and that's all, these are my references. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. That was very um, informative. There was a lot of uh, good references pointed out when it comes to uh, mediastinal and pretty much staging in general. Just uh, just to, uh, to emphasize about uh, what Kevin already said, uh, a lot of uh, uh, the topic and the, the most recent guidelines actually were done by the ACCP in 2013. There were other guidelines after that, not given by any of the major societies at least, but there has been a lot of more current studies that can actually have to have talked about how to do the assignment staging, uh, for example, with EBAS, etc., when to consider a um, centrally located lesions. So, um, and I'm sure that the guidelines uh, will be reactualized pretty soon with all this new um, uh, information that has been published ever since 2013. Um, it is also uh, important to have all this in consideration. This is what I always tell you, the ones who have been already in the bronchoscopy suite, which is I think pretty much all, almost all of you. When you do staging, always, always, always see a patient when you see a patient in clinic, I would say, or when you see a patient in bronchoscopy, it's when, when you have a, a, a suspicion for cancer, uh, always uh, think about um, how you're going to uh, approach the patient. Uh, if you have a patient with suspicion, then the, your next step is not necessarily to give a diagnosis, but just to put everything together and say, okay, what is the staging based on the radiologic findings? And then after that, if there is anything that can actually be um, uh, said uh, um, uh, and can actually guide uh, your staging, 
uh, at the same time a procedure that can guide your staging at the same time of, uh, of diagnosis to avoid two or three different procedures for that. So um, there is, uh, um, it's actually here, I don't know if you see that, uh, Kevin. Uh, Oh, so Dr. Debian is actually mentioning something. I don't know if you, all the, uh, everybody has, uh, uh, can read it, but uh, uh, there's something that he's, he has mentioned, which is actually true. It is the uh, uh, mediastinal stage in peripheral stage 1A, uh, which is the, uh, uh, the stage 1A that, uh, that uh, Kevin mentioned, meaning the, the nodule that is hypermetabolic on PET scan uh, and very peripherally located and there's nothing else seeing abnormal on mediastinal or hilar uh, areas. So it's not necessarily wrong to pursue an EBA staging in these patients. Um, uh, this was a great two recommendation based on those guidelines. Uh, again, there's uh, more literature that has come up uh, ever since then. And then uh, it, it kind of guide us to the point that maybe we should be doing med uh, mediastinal staging with EBAS even to stage one patients. Again, uh, uh, there's still literature and, 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 and studies that um, are controversial right now, but, 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 but yes, uh, it is true, it's a great two recommendation, not necessarily wrong to pursue an EBAS staging in these patients. So, uh, Kevin, would you like to add on anything else? Uh, no, I, I mean, I think, like I, you know, that like you had mentioned, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that's been published since those 2013 guidelines. Um, so, uh, there's a, when you read that, there's a lot that is potentially outdated. Yeah, and I, and I think uh, we'll be looking forward to new guidelines in the near future. Um, uh, with a compilation of all these studies. And I'm sure that these things continue to evolve and, and time will tell in terms of um, what new guidelines will be following from now on. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, that was a great presentation. So uh, we're gonna have a couple of minutes before we start with Dan with the next uh, talk, okay? Thank you. <laughs>
you know, we're having some uh, technical difficulty right now. If you uh, just give us a minute, I don't know. Dan, can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, okay, perfect. Do you want to start uh, sharing your screen? Yeah, I can do that. Okay, hold on a second. Okay, go ahead. Is it working? Uh, yes, it is. Okay, so uh, uh, I'm gonna introduce now uh, our own uh, Dan Travick. He's uh, gonna talk to us today about neutropenic fever. Um, whenever you're ready, Dan. Okay. All right, I'll get started. Um, I'm Dan, one of the EMIM crits. I'll be talking about neutropenic fever today. Uh, just a few disclosures. Uh, first, uh, this theme was uh, called Droplet. So given everything that's been going on, I felt as though it was sort of pertinent. Number two, I have been off uh, uh, for the last 10 days by training a two-year-old. I am a broken man. So you are going to have to listen to the ramblings of me for the next mm, 20 to 30 minutes at least talking about neutropenic fever. Uh, please feel free to laugh in the text group. Uh, it makes me feel a little bit better. It's kind of odd giving a presentation looking at two screens, so uh, we'll sort of go from there. I do also want to preface this, uh, give uh, a quick disclaimer. Um, it was announced this morning that uh, IV Lysol and, um, you know, uh, IV uh, ultraviolet light will also cure neutropenic fever, so please make sure you guys keep that in mind. With that being said, I'll be professional and continue. Let's start with a little bit of clinical cases with neutropenic fever. Um, the first one, let's talk about, it's a 39-year-old history of lymphoma and active chemotherapy presenting with 24 hours of fever. Um, really no other significant symptoms that he's been having. He was not given any prophylaxis after the chemotherapy was finished. He comes in a little tachycardic, a little febrile, otherwise hemodynamically stable. He does have an ANC of 300. Um, so the question majorly is how do you assess this patient's risk factors, which treatment do you give them, and what's their disposition? And all of these cases are going to have a little bit of a question at the end that hopefully throughout the uh, presentation today I'll be able to answer some of these and then at the end we'll go through how to do it. Um, second one, a 60-year-old, hypertension, diabetic, colon cancer, mets to the liver, active chemotherapy, coming in with abdominal pain and fever, some nausea, but tolerating liquid at home really doesn't have any other symptoms. He's a little bit more tachycardic than the previous one, a little bit more febrile. His ANC is 200, he's got some end organ damage. So what antibiotics does this patient get? And what is your disposition? And then a 75 year old history of CKD hypertension, AML, status post transplant, who is presenting with malaise, fevers, fatigue, nausea, uh, fevers up to 40 at home. Pretty tachycardic, febrile, hypotensive, vasopressors, no ANC, hemoglobin of seven, creatinine of 3.8 from a normal baseline. So what is your treatment regimen? So I'm gonna try and talk about uh, certain things to be able to risk stratify these patients as well as clinical decision-making tools and some of the guidelines of how to treat them. Uh, given the fact that we're all sort of all over the place, we have, in respect to our fellows, we have uh, you know, outpatient, we have ER, we have ICU. So I'm going to try and go through a little bit of all of it uh, when we approach a patient who has uh, neutropenia and a fever. So of course, uh, definitions and epidemiology. So the definitions of both neutropenia and fever vary based upon what source, uh, but combined efforts from specialties have helped shape guidelines. Uh, primary ones being Infectious Diseases Society of America, the Society of Critical Care Medicine, and the American Society of Clinical Oncology. I'll sort of reference some of them throughout the entire presentation. It's also worth noting that a lot of these um, information and guidelines revolve around chemotherapy and cancer patients. Um, I'm not going to delve too deeply into other conditions which have neutropenia associated or other medications that cause neutropenia, uh, but just keep in mind that not just cancer patients are going to have neutropenic fever, and um, uh, primarily a lot of the guidelines that come out are based upon this given the sheer number of patients we have from that. Fever does occur quite frequently in your chemotherapy patients. Up to 50% of patients with solid tumors report fevers. And in those with hematologic malignancies, uh, it's been reported greater than 80% of them actually have fevers throughout their course. Uh, 
Of those, about 20 to 30 percent uh, have clinically documented infections, the most common sites being intestinal tract, lung, and skin. Bacteremia in those patients is documented about 10 to 25 percent. And from those findings, the prolonged neutropenia is the biggest risk factor. And again, this is likely due, especially from the gut, given the disruption of the normal flora and breakdown in cellular uh, barriers uh, from the chemotherapy. So I'll talk a little bit about the organisms. It's very interesting. When we first started giving cytotoxic chemotherapy back in the 60s and 70s, we were noticing having some gram negatives in the blood primarily. Um, and then as we got a little bit better with indwelling catheters, Hickman's, things of that nature, we found that gram positives actually predominated in the 80s to 90s. Predominance now uh, is largely gram negative species, E. coli, Klebsiella, Enterobacter, Pseudomonas being your most common ones. Of the gram positive bugs that we do actually see, coag negative staph, MRSA, VRE, some more resistant organisms are actually coming out as well. And of course, the definition of a fever. IDSA and the American College of Critical Care Medicine actually came together in 2008. Their recommendations are a single oral temperature measurement of greater than 38.3 degrees Celsius or temperature greater than 38 degrees Celsius over a one hour period. They also put in there that it is reasonable to consider a lower threshold in the neutropenic patient. Um, I wanted to share this terrible image because I just found this man's facial expression very, very interesting. Um, the fact that he's taking his temperature with a sweater as well as a button down um, was very interesting. So I just feel like you all had to see that picture. Again, I've been at home with two children for 10 days. So in your fever differential, when you have your patients who are neutropenic, again, remember that fever is a very nonspecific sign of infection. And as we're seeing um, with the predominance of our COVID patients, there's a lot of reasons to have a fever with a lot of other systemic responses, viral, fungal, drug reaction, transfusion reactions, mucositis, cytokine storm, rejection, VTE. And in patients that fevers persist greater than 72 hours despite antibiotics, it's important to consider either a localized infection, abscesses, or things of that nature, uh, a second bacterial infection on top of it, resistant species, or the things above as well. In regards to neutropenia, more definitions. Neutropenia um, defined as related to risk of infection. So true neutropenia is less than 1,500 cells per cubic millimeter. Um, they define it as severe with less than 500. The IDSA uh, in the setting of a fever describes uh, neutropenia as less than 500 cells or an ANC that is expected to decrease by 500 cells during the next 48 hours. And there have been a lot of studies primarily in the early 2000s sort of looking at different cutoffs to try and improve your sensitivity and specificity for severe bacterial infections. Um, looking at most of them, you can see I had to include Apostolopoulos' uh, paper in 2010 because he looked at 102 patients in Greece and for some reason he had an ANC less than 500 with an odds ratio of bacteremia of 27, which was very significant with a high sensitivity and uh, negative predictive value. Other studies, HA in 2010, as well as Santalaya in 2001, um, also demonstrated that lower cutoffs of ANC um, had positive odds ratios of bacteremia. The uh, Institute of uh, Health and Clinical Excellence in the UK looked at all of this information, um, and this is sort of, oh, let me see if I can pull my laser pointer. And this was their uh, nice little table they had, basically demonstrating that, um, you know, as your ANC gets lower, there's still continued odds ratios of high risk of bacterial infection. Um, the study from 2010 out of Greece, sort of a little bit of an outlier if you look at this image. Um, but still, even as you use lower cutoffs, they still had odds ratios that were uh, statistically significant for bacterial infection. They also, including IDSA and a number of other papers, have further definitions of profound neutropenia, which is an ANC less than 100 but they also define functional neutropenia in these patients as well, in which their malignancy actually results in the qualitative defects in the neutrophils. And these patients, despite having a normal neutrophil count, should be considered either high risk or um, if they do have a fever, should be considered to have febrile neutropenia. So sort of risk stratifying your patients. Um, when you have a febrile neutropenia patient, you sort of look at, try and gauge whether they're high or low risk on the initial presentation. 
So if they've had prolonged neutropenia for greater than seven days, if they have profound neutropenia with an ANC less than 100, obviously if they're hemodynamically unstable or if they have other concerning clinical features for a severe bacterial infection or a focal point of infection, including pneumonia, if they have abdominal pain or neurologic complaints. Patients that are considered lower risk, if they have no or few comorbidities or if they have an anticipated neutropenia less than seven days. Um, and this was published by the IDSA with a level of evidence that is uh, A2, at least a few cohorted and observational studies that went into this. So an important part of the evaluation of the fibron neutropenic patient, at least on the initial presentation, uh, there was a decent study of 756 patients done in 2000 by Klosterski. Uh, he used some objective as well as subjective data, subjective data in order to determine high and low risk patients. Um, there were obviously, given the fact that um, it was back in 2000 and there's some uh, subjective data in this, it is at some sort of bias. Um, he called it the Multinational Association for Supportive Care and Cancer Risk Index Score. Uh, as you can see by my little box there, that it is on MD-Calc. It uh, is an additive risk stratification, so 21 is a cutoff for being low risk. So uh, the lower the score indicate, indicates that the patient is a higher risk. So you actually want a high score in this one. So you can put in a, a number of different variables, including the burden of illness, sort of a subjective input. Obviously, if they're very sick, they get zero points, so their score becomes lower if they're hypotensive. Interestingly enough, back in 2000, uh, they included active COPD, bronchitis, if there was a need for oxygen therapy, and or bronchodilators. Uh, and it's a pretty significant part of this as well, as it does contribute four points to the overall score. Uh, the type of cancer was also taken into account whether or not they were dehydrated requiring IV fluids, whether the fever was inpatient or outpatient, and how old they were. Um, and then once you calculated this risk, uh, you, there's a nice little flow chart you can sort of go through to try and help guide your destination for the patient. If they're high risk, they recommend admitting them. If they're low risk, you can consider either inpatient or outpatient based upon a number of things, sort of what we'll talk about in a little bit. But primarily outpatient are those patients who can tolerate oral medications, they have close follow-up, uh, they have a neutrophil count that's anticipated to last uh, less than seven days, and as long as it's not less than 100, and clinically, quote unquote, they look clinically stable. Um, this had a, a specificity of actually 68% for significant bacterial infection, a sensitivity of 71%, but it did have a positive predictive value of 91% in the low risk patients. Uh, this was recommended by IDSA since 2002 for the evaluation of brown neutropenia uh, with uh, level B evidence so far. <laughs> So what do I do? Well, you get serologic workup. And uh, depending on the uh, blood culture availability at your institution, uh, you can get blood cultures and cultures uh, depending on the symptoms the patient has. Imaging uh, really depends on their symptomatology. There's no standardized guidelines for all of these patients, but obviously if they have a cough or um, sputum production, get a chest X-ray, abdominal pain, consider CT, um, basically image based upon the patient's complaints. Antibiotics. Yes, and we'll sort of get to that in a moment. So for the antibiotic regimen, um, I'm going to sort of divide it into three different uh, types. Not really three different types. I'll talk about the outpatient guidelines, I'll talk about the inpatient guidelines, and then Henry Ford actually has their own guidelines and algorithms that I'll go over as well. For the science nerds out there, uh, I decided to include some chemical structures, that's cefepime in the lower right here, some vancomycin and some piptaz, because let's face it, that's what we're gonna give. For an outpatient, they actually have pretty good clinical guidelines. The ASCO and the IDSA uh, published uh, clinical practice guidelines in 2018. There was an expert panel review of six meta-analyses and six primary studies that were added from the previous guidelines. Uh, the first number one thing they say is use your clinical judgment. The patient doesn't look good if they're too hemodynamically unstable, if they don't have support or follow-up, and this is not a patient that receives an outpatient regimen. They also recommend using the MESC score or uh, other clinical criteria to try and help aid in your decision. They actually say that if you have a patient or considering for an outpatient, they want antibiotics within one hour. The current recommended guidelines are oral fluoroquinolones and augmentin or clindamycin if they are allergic. Obviously, they recommend close follow-up, stay in contact with your patient, and warning signs and symptoms to return. 
Um, and they actually recommend if the patient does not defervesce within two to three days to consider inpatient treatment. So let's talk about inpatient. The actual guidelines for uh, neutropenic fever are monotherapy with anti-pseudomonal beta-lactam agent, cefepime, meropenem, piptazo, or if patients cannot, then IV Cipro plus Clinda or as M plus Vanco if they're penicillin allergic. The gram positive coverage is actually not recommended as a standard of care for the initial regimen. However, if there is a strong consideration for gram positive infection, such as the patient's hemodynamically unstable, they have a skin infection, their port looks terrible, or their pick line looks very red, and there's parents coming out of it, then they recommend gram positive coverage level for this is uh, A1. They actually recommend starting antibiotics within two hours of initial presentation, which is one hour longer than outpatient. One of the other questions with febrile neutropenia is when do we add coverage? So this is probably the biggest topic in febrile neutropenia um, that has a lot of discussion around it. Um, if the patient remains clinically uh, unstable or they deteriorate after the initial doses, then the recommendations are to broaden your coverage to include gram positive, if you started them out on monotherapy, gram negative coverage, to broaden with uh, anaerobic and fungi coverage as well. You can consider monitoring these patients for fungal infections with serology initially, getting a beta-2 glucan or a T2 um, galactamin in, in those select patients. Uh, but they don't actually recommend empiric fungal coverage um, until after four to seven days if there's been continued fevers, uh, clinical decompensation, and there's no source. However, if you have negative serology, negative imaging, either of the chest or sinus CT or your suspected source of infection, there's no recovery of fungi from anywhere, from any body site, uh, then you can actually withhold your, your antifungals. Antiviral, uh, based upon the clinical and laboratory evidence of an active disease, if you're worried about HSV or VZV, uh, either encephalitis or skin uh, or disseminated infection, then acyclovir, uh, influenza, uh, neuraminidase inhibitor therapy as well. Interestingly enough, out of all of these, um, there is some data in Publisher. They talk about hematopoietic stem cell transplant patients. Interestingly enough, they have a VRE bacteremia predominance sometimes with uh, 10 to 35 percent of these patients actually during or after uh, the stem cell therapy. So it would not be unreasonable if you have one of these patients that's decompensating and not improving or as monotherapy excuse me, not as monotherapy, in addition to your gram-negative, you can consider using DAPTO or linazolid based upon your, your source or uh, previous cultures. Another topic uh, in febrile neutropenia is your granulocyte colony stimulating factors, neupogen. So a little bit about it, it increases the myeloid production of the granulocytes in the neutrophils. It has been shown to reduce the risk and the duration of febrile neutropenia. It's recommended use as primary prophylaxis when the febrile neutropenia exceeds 20%. There's a whole scoring system based upon um, oncologic data that I'm not going to delve into, um, but it's based upon the patient, uh, the treatment therapy, the medication-specific factors. And with its role in febrile neutropenia, it's actually not recommended as an adjunct of therapy with antibiotics and established febrile neutropenia by the ASCO. However, it can be considered in patients with a fever and neutropenia who are at high risk for infection-associated complications or who have prognostic factors predicative of poor clinical outcomes, which is basically anyone admitted to the ICU, it seems. Expected prolonged and profound neutropenia if anyone's greater than 65 and has an uncontrolled primary disease, hypertension, diabetes, anything of that nature, if they have pneumonia, hypotension, or basically sepsis if they have an inf invasive fungal infection or hospitalization at the time of the fever development. And these are the patients that you can consider an adjunctive uh, uh, granulocyte stimulating colony factor in these patients. And this is actually a strong recommendation with high quality evidence per the ASCO. So there is actually a meta-analysis on this as well. Uh, Cochrane did a review of 14 randomized control studies uh, including 1,500 patients addressing the role of the stimulating factor plus antibiotics in febrile neutropenia. Their primary outcomes when they're looking at this was mortality, and it did not appear that adding the stimulating factors to the antibiotics uh, improved statistically an improvement in the mortality, um, nor did it change the infection-related mortality. However, it did have some other benefits when they looked at some of its secondary outcomes and the subgroup analysis. Um, it had statistically improvement neutrophil recovery and a shorter neutropenic period, 
They had uh, rec faster recovery from fever and a shorter duration of antibiotic use. And there were fewer hospitalizations lasting greater than 10 days. Of the side effects of the stimulating factor itself, there was no difference in the groups between venous thromboembolism, but there was increased myalgias and bone pain in those patients. So again, they really didn't show a mortality benefit, but there are other um, improvements that can be seen in the study that may be helpful to your patient in the long term. This is actually Henry Ford's tier one policy on uh, febrile neutropenia. Uh, I'll go over it just a little bit, but it's basically in conjunction with a lot of things that we've been saying so far. Uh, high, high risk patients that in this instance, actually they exclude the stem cell transplant patients, pan culture, everything. Um, if they're stable, they recommend cefepime. And again, they put in plus minus vancomycin and metronidazole, but if you look down here, it just depends on the things that we had already spoken about. Is there skin infection? Is there catheter related infection? Are they unstable? That sort of thing. And then you reassess them in 48 to 72 hours. Um, and if they're afebrile and there's no source, if the patient is afebrile for 48 hours and the ANC is greater than 1,000, they actually recommend discontinuation of the antibiotics. Um, if the patient comes back positive, then you treat them uh, essentially based upon the etiology or until they're afebrile for 48 hours and the ANC is greater than 1,000, so whichever is longer. So long course of antibiotics. And then down here, um, if they're unstable patient, vancomycin and cefepime, plus minus an amygdala glucoside, but also with flagyl. Continue to reassess them. If they're persistently febrile um, and there's no change, uh, Henry Ford actually recommends an ID consult. Um, continuing the antibiotics um, and then working up everything else to see if there's any other source of localized infection, things of that nature. Um, if they worsen, then consider broadening your coverage as well, but um, largely doing the same sort of things, continuing your broad workup. This is another uh, algorithm that I found through my lit search that I think is a little bit cleaner, which sort of says basically the same thing, but um, given my ADD, it's a lot easier to sort of follow a single arrow rather than a lot of uh, odd branch points. So similar sort of thing, if they're febrile, ANC, this one actually says less than 1500. If they're low risk, uh, consider the outpatient route. If they're high risk, then sort of things that we've been talking about, are they known to have resistant organism? Are they hemodynamically unstable? Um, and then continue with the antibiotics that we had discussed previously. So one of the other topics whenever talking about fibrile neutropenia is when can I stop the antibiotics? This will make all of the infectious disease colleagues happy. Um, the IDSA, their recommendations are early antibiotic therapy until there are signs of marrow recovery in ANC greater than 500. This was uh, based on 2B evidence. This was years of experience have shown this to be safe. And then the European Conference of Infections and Leukemia, um, if they're hemodynamically stable from presentation and afibra for 72 hours or more, uh, regardless of their ANC count, they say you can stop antibiotics. And this is quality of evidence level two. This is just observational studies from their group. So the major thing with, with this is trying to figure out, is it safe to continue antibiotics? Because if you have patients who have febrile neutropenia, maybe they're not getting filgastrum or neupogen or things of that nature, and they're expected to have a prolonged um, ANC, you can have antibiotics on for quite a long time with no source of infection. So there's been a lot of research into this, trying to figure out, are there good guidelines? Um, so there aren't. Uh, there are no clear guidelines from literature or clinical societies, really, that, that give hard and fast rules. There have been some more recent studies since the previous um, guidelines um, have been published. There was uh, La Cleche in 2008. Uh, this was done in France, I believe, published in the UK, and the Antibio Stop, a very um, uh, prospective observational study of 123 patients. Um, he had 238 cases of febrile neutropenia. The primary outcome of the study was actually just the feasibility and the safety of short-term antibiotics and fever run on origin. Uh, it was irrespective of their ANC. They just wanted to see if they could stop them early, um, regardless of what the recovery ANC account. So the phase one of their trial was antibiotic discontinuation after 48 hours of apyrexia, however long that took. And phase two was um, a hard stop at five days, respectively. They found that there was no statistical difference between the two groups um, in the um, mentioned categories here of mortality, ICU admissions, or relapse of infection after 48 hours of discontinuation. Um, average change in therapy was a couple of days uh, between the two groups. 
However, it was a pretty limited study. There were very few patients. Um, it was a prospective study, and they even mentioned that in their, their group, there was a violation in the protocol by about 20% of cases. But it does give some idea that maybe there's something here. So Aguilar also in 2017, uh, he did the, or they did the long, uh, how long study, which was trying to discontinue antibiotics. This is an open label randomized controlled phase four study in six hospitals in Spain. Uh, they were able to do 156 high risk uh, hematologic patients with febrile neutropenia. Um, the control group received antibiotics until the ANC was greater than 500. And the study group had antimicrobials discontinued at 72 hours. So the discontinuation um, of the antimicrobials at 72 hours of apyrexia and clinical recovery was safe. Uh, they did uh, anti-pseudomonal monotherapy uh, or combination therapy, either aminoglycoside and fluoroquinolone. Their uh, outcome, they had 4.5 days of antimicrobial difference irrespective of the neutrophil count in these patients. And there was no difference in the two groups uh, in the total days of fever or in their crude mortality. Um, the recurrence of the fevers and secondary infections uh, were similar in both groups, actually. So in 2019, there, Stern did a Cochrane review about antibiotic discontinuation. Um, there were eight randomized control studies comprising of 662 distinct fibronitropenia episodes. Um, this included children and adults, and uh, part of the issue is all but two of them were performed before 2000. Um, their patients were primarily cancer with fever of unknown origin and excluded those with documented microbiological infection. Um, their primary outcome was comparing short course of antibiotics to long course with the outcome being 30 day mortality and they found no statistical difference between the two groups, but um, it was very low certainty of evidence. They did note that there were fewer fever days and overall course of antibiotics was um, in the short course of studies, but there were no difference in rates of clinical failure but again, very low certainty with, with all of this. So looking back at our, our clinical cases with all of these, so the 39-year-old who um, clinically doesn't look that bad, maybe a little bit tachycardic, tolerating PO, his risk stratification score is 26. He has good follow-up, so it would be appropriate based upon the guidelines presentation, as long as he looks good, to discharge him home with appropriate follow-up. Um, you can do Cipro and Augment, and those are recommended by the guidelines. The 60-year-old who has metastatic colon cancer uh, on active chemotherapy, um, which antibiotics does this patient get? And what is your disposition? So abdominal pain, his MET score is 19, so he's high-risk patient. He has end organ damage, he should be admitted, and it's feasible to start him on uh, IV single uh, beta-lactam antipsudomonal coverage. And then clinical case three, uh, the sick one who's on vasopressors, uh, end organ damage, what is your treatment regimen? So this is septic shock recurring ICU admission. Um, he's, or they, uh, are on broad spectrum antibiotics, including the gram positive coverage. And what's interesting and based upon the other evidence, you know, he's AML status well stem cell transplant. So it's not unreasonable to do linazolid in this situation if you're worried about VRE and their predominance. So in summary, fever, 38.1 consecutive hours or 38.3 once. Neutropenic fever varies, but generally what's accepted is ANC less than 500 and febra. If it's important to categorize your patients into low or high risk with a stratification tool and to initiate broad gram negative coverage, including gram positive if they're unstable or if you have clinical suspicion. And you can add coverage based upon your clinical data and workup if it's persistent. You can consider nupogen or the stimulating factors in uh, appropriate cases. And as far as like how long to keep the antibiotics, there's no clear evidence or guidelines. So there needs to be more studies on that, um, but it will be kind of difficult um, in order to determine if you can early uh, discontinue your antibiotics if your workup is negative. These are some of my references. And these are my offspring. That's a beautiful picture, Dan. Thanks. Beautiful pictures. <laughs> Uh, they, uh, they, you know, my mailman looks just like them. <laughs> wow. That was a uh, very interesting, um, uh, very illustrative and, um, a lot of uh, information and data on that presentation. Thank you very much. I have, uh, uh there was a question there, uh, that they mentioned, and this is Aditya, whether, uh, uh, there was any role for procalcitonin on the setting of, uh, 
on the use on these patients with uh, neutrof uh, febrile neutropenia? What do you think? Um, you know, it's a it's a it's a good uh, question. You know, as it's been validated for pneumonias and things of that nature, um, I didn't delve too deeply into it, but I think it can uh, help with your overall clinical picture. Um, you know, if you if you follow your trends and your procalcitonins, you're going to continue antibiotics for these patients for several days at the very least. And so if you see that your numbers are trending down, you have no other source of infection and things of that nature, I think you can help tailor your antibiotics based upon that as well. Right. And, and, and I know that there's more data coming out about the use of procalcitonins for bacterial infections, not just pneumonia. So um, I didn't do a complete search on that, but um, I know that there's data emerging on that as well. Yeah, no, I think you're right. That, 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 that there could be a role in, in the near future for that too. Um, I actually unmuted everybody, all the attendees, so you guys are free to speak if you want to ask a question uh, uh, to Dan. Hi, uh, this, hi, this is Aditya. Uh, again, like, you know, it, it was interesting. You know, thank you for this lecture. It was very informative. Uh, I was just wondering, like, uh, you know, patients, some patients, you know, who, have, who are recovering from uh, the neutropenia and still are neutropenic, uh, but their counts are going up. How often do you see iris with fibra neutropenia? And because both of them will present the same way, they both mm -hmm. will have fever and uh, everything else. So how do you differentiate? I mean, is there any way to differentiate between these two clinical entities? Because the treatment will be vastly different if it's iris versus fibril neutropenia, right? So, yeah, I, um, I don't have a definite answer for you. I didn't delve too deeply into that, but my, my clinical suspicion was that, as you just sort of mentioned also with your procalcitonin, your culture, your clinical symptomatology, your further imaging, you know, if you don't identify a source of infection, mm -hmm. um, you know, really after a couple of days, start really thinking about something else and then treating from there. So I think, um, can I help with that, uh, Dan? Absolutely. Yes, please. It's Varadi. So I think what you're trying to ask, uh, Adi, is about engraftment syndrome. When, when in stem cell transplants, you start seeing recovery mm -hmm. of the marrow, and then you have the same exact inflammatory response, a fever, right. tachycardia, surge response, which can be confused for infection. Exactly. So, so the thing is that, you know, you have to just keep a, um, from an ID standpoint, we keep the antibiotics on till we have ruled out infection. And once we, we are very sure that this fevers are from engraftment syndrome and mm -hmm. the cultures are negative, you just stop antibiotics. It's basically about your clinical judgment about, you know, um, does the picture fit? And if you start seeing the marrow recover, you have your cultures negative, you know that this was engraftment syndrome fevers. I see. And people can get very sick. They can get... Um, they can even get hypoxemic respiratory failure during that mm -hmm. time, which we specifically we see with ATRA and other chemotherapies, but you can right. have the ATRA lung syndrome. So those are things you have to keep in mind. Um, mm -hmm. But I think the safest approach usually is to start antibiotics, rule out infection, then stop it. And, and do you use steroids in that case? If it's, you, you're Not thinking... typically, no. You just need to let the engraftment syndrome take its course. It will, right. you know, so... Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot for your uh, input. Thank you. Is there any other question from the uh, participants, the attendees? Oh. Well, that was great, uh, Dan. Thank you very much. I appreciate the, the, the lecture, the information. It was really good. Okay. Um, I appreciate it. Thank no, thank you. So for everybody else, uh, for the fellows, um, I just want to see how, how things are doing and you guys uh, have any questions about how um, things are being um, um, happening here at the hospital, if you have any concerns or something. Well, it seems like everybody, everybody's okay with things happening here. Who is watching the par parade today? <laughs> yeah, I heard the parade is going to be at six o'clock, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Is any any of you staying? I'm coming back to see it. Are you? Yes. ID department is seeing it. Good. <laughs> Where is it going to be again, Verity? 
Well, the email said that they had like four or five different spots. I'd sent a um, snapshot of it to our group. I think it was main entrance, 24 hour entrance, ED and M unit. I see. Most of our critical care team was involved in like taking care of a lot of police officers. So I think whoever in house should see it. No, I, I agree. I, I think I think that's uh, actually a, a very good idea. I also had the opportunity to see to see him, actually, at this specific patient uh, for a day only. But yeah, it was very. Um, uh, it's, there's a lot of emotions there, and I think this. I think it's a great it's a great opportunity to to share, and and to see, uh, you know, the results of what everybody has done. So uh, anything else, any, any, any questions you have? Uh, you know, things have been sort of like uh, steady over the last few days uh, with these uh, updates that uh, we've been sending every day. I wonder if, uh, if everybody agrees just to now to send those updates, maybe every, uh, I was thinking maybe like two or three times a week only instead of every day since there's not much happening. Unless of course something happens in that case, um, We'll send it more often. What do you guys think? That's fine with me. Yeah, everybody agree? Yes, it makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Um, uh, as I also explained earlier, uh, a few days ago, a couple of days ago, this uh, incentive that uh, will be paid to all of you guys that have been uh, on the front lines, um, you know, uh, it's a recognition from the hospital. I think it's, it's definitely due and it's just, uh, it's just a shown from the hospital to say thanks. Uh, it's a small token of appreciation um, for everything that you guys have done. I mean, we're all very proud of you. I got nothing to do with that, but uh, you know, the hospital has decided on that and I think it's great and we applaud that, so. Uh, so I have a question here. Every uh, there's a question here. What's happening with graduation? Um, so we still don't have any word about that. Um, um, uh, the uh, the venue has already be uh, you know is is uh, is on hold, uh, meaning that uh, everything. Uh, so far, if they opened, uh,